Upon completing a task, by Venerable Master Xingyun, the founder of Fu Guangsheng. O great compassionate Buddha, I am so joyful. I would like to tell you joyously, Buddha, that my task has been completed, that my career has attained paramita. Through diligent effort. And continuous hard work, I have finally completed my task. My work has finally attained paramita. I am not thinking about my own achievement or my own merits. I only hope to contribute to all beings, to provide service for the future. O、oh、Buddha, I remember. That you cultivated merit and wisdom for three asamkhya kalpas, practice for eons of lifetime, to attain marks of excellence. O Buddha, thinking of the countless virtues that you have achieved, and the immeasurable kalpas which you have practiced, how insignificant are my accomplishments? O great compassionate Buddha, I am ignorant and incompetent. I pray to you, grant me wisdom and agility. Grant me kindness, compassion, and right view. May I be able to forge ahead and bring glory and honor to my family. Serve my community well. Contribute to society. Devote all energy and efforts to my country. O great compassionate Buddha, there are times when I have become indolent. There are times when I have become dispirited. I pray to you, Buddha, when I am indolent, please support me with your power, so I can strive and progress zealously. When I'm dispirited, please encourage me to move forward bravely. O great compassionate Buddha, I pray for your protection. Please give me understanding when I'm studying. Please give me right view when I am thinking. Please give me confidence when I am working. Please give me right mindfulness when I am cultivating. O Buddha, I pray for your protection. May I keep on progressing. May I strive forward courageously. O great compassionate Buddha, please accept my sincerest prayer. 
O great compassionate Buddha. Please accept my sincerest prayer. Namo Sakyamuni Buddha. May Auspicious blessings to you all. May everyone be well and healthy. Thank you for including the Foguangshan English Dharma Services channel in your weekly cultivation. We are happy to have proceeded into Season 2, benefiting self and other. This week, as requested by some of our audience, I would like to offer an introduction to the Heart Sutra. We know that, including our current chanting procedure, in almost every short Buddhist service at Foguangshan, the Hat Sutra is always being chanted. There are three reasons to why we chant a sutra in a Buddhist chanting service. Number one, for heart-to-heart connections with the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Number two, for merits and blessings that arise from the act of reciting the Buddha's sacred teachings. And number three, most importantly, to attain the insight and wisdom from the teachings delivered by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas which are being chanted. Many of us probably have done this hundreds of times. However, have you ever wondered why the Hat Sutra is so common? What is the text teaching us? Is this teaching easy to understand to you? And how much of it are you yet to grasp? Let us begin with the title of the sutra, Pranya Paramita Hridaya Sutra. Pranya Paramita means the perfection of wisdom, while Hridaya represents the heart or core of the teaching. And sutra means the discourse that was delivered by the Buddha or in the presence of the Buddha. We can look at the Sanskrit word backwards and to see that Pranya Paramita Hridaya Sutra means a discourse on the heart of the perfection of wisdom. Pranya Paramita could also represent the other shore. Therefore, by learning the heart of this wonderful insight or teaching, we are able to perfect our understanding and then eventually reach the other shore. In short, many of us refer to the sutra as the Heart Sutra. In the Heart Sutra, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva is being asked a question by Sariputra under the inspiration of the Buddha 
who has entered deep samadhi. Where the question asks, how does one practice and train in order to attain the perfection of wisdom? Thus, we're led into the sutra with this Q&A, where we see this awakened sentient being, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, who seems to sit in a very relaxed and free posture and entered a deep contemplation on his journey of awakening. Thus, the sutra opens with Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. While contemplating profoundly the pranyaparamita, realized that the five skandhas are empty, and thus he was able to overcome all suffering. We now join the awakened sentient being on this journey of enlightenment, where we are taught three levels of emptiness, or shunyata, in order for us to better understand the self, the world, as well as the self and other. On level one, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva talks about emptiness of the self by telling us that he realized that the five skandhas are empty and this is how he was able to overcome all ills and suffering. What are the five skandhas? Also known as the five heaps or the five aggregates, they consist of form, which is the color of physical shapes which our sensory organs can detect. Number two, feelings or sensations which arise as a result of our sensory organs coming in contact with the physical forms. Number three, perception, which is when we begin to label these experiences or these images such as good or bad. And number four, mental forces or volition, which become the decisions or the intentions which result from these perceptions that will affect how we react to the experience. And number five, consciousness, which is basically a storage of memory and experiences of the previous four, which on the next experience of a similar form or sensation, when it clicks, then all these memories will come back and then affect our way of responding or reacting to that. In other words, we can refer to the five skandhas as the five aspects of the human experience, where we rely largely on our sensory organs and the brain to react or to interact with the physical world. For example, what do you see on the screen? If you tell me that it is a scoop of ice cream, I would have to say, why? And chances are it would have been on some occasion when you first saw this round, white, glistening scoop. And when you put a part of it onto your tongue, where your taste buds tell you that this is a very icy, sweet, cool, and beautiful sensation. And so you perceive this as something delicious, a wonderful dessert. And then the next time, or following that experience, whether you like or not, your mental forces of volition will make a decision as to where you want more or you're going to reject this experience that you do not like. And then this process is stored in your consciousness. And that is why at this moment when you see this picture, you would tell me that it's ice cream. But what if I told you that this is not ice cream? Okay. It's actually a scoop of butter. Then suddenly, your memory of that cold, icy, sweet, glistening sensation at the tip of your tongue turns into something greasy and sickening. And so the next time when you see something similar, you're not going to jump to the conclusion of picking up the spoon to actually take a large scoop to put into your mouth. Next time, you're going to examine a little bit more. And therefore, these five skandhas, according to Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, are empty. 
and by empty it actually means that these do not have an everlasting unchanging eternal self they are all momentary coming together of conditions which eventually will disperse and any time these conditions disperse your experience of that form or your labeled feeling or sensations will will begin to change and so to see that the five skandhas are empty it means that we are able to really take a peek through the reality in detail and not be led by the nose based on these feelings or sensations and so according to avalokiteshvara bodhisattva by overcoming this or by seeing that these are empty then there's a chance for us to overcome suffering the meaning of dukkha is threefold first of all we usually understand dukkha as suffering however it perhaps should not be translated as suffering but merely as dissatisfaction if we ask ourselves what is the suffering of the body we must realize that while the body is conducive to suffering but in and of itself the body is not itself suffering that is when you ask which of the body and suffering comes first when avalokiteshvara became free from suffering what did he get rid of this is the moment when this bodhisattva teaches us that by seeing that the five skandhas are, are empty one does not eliminate anything but what we do is actually that we abandon the desire for that thing what we must realize is that when desire is not fulfilled or when what you end up getting is not what you want you feel dukkha so why is it suffering or dissatisfaction it is so because the i do not like it the second definition of dukkha is change since we have a notion of the self we tend to hold on to the idea of a permanent self we usually not wish to recognize that we are different or changing all the time the wish for the body to be permanent when its nature is change brings about dissatisfaction or unhappiness the third definition of dukkha is that when we refuse to accept the fact that everything is conditioned so when the conditions come together that is when we experience the phenomena but we must realize that eventually the conditions will also disperse once these conditions disperse what we are experiencing will also disappear therefore as the bodhisattva sees the emptiness in the dukkha that arises out of a notion of i that refuses change or the i that wants to be this overall independent phenomenon then there's a chance for us to see the level 1 emptiness of emptiness of the self the heart sutra goes on to say sariputra form is not different from emptiness emptiness is not different from form form is in fact emptiness and emptiness is in fact form in this line we see that the translation of shunya is rendered as emptiness or sometimes void or devoid this means that when we say that form is not different from emptiness we are not saying that there is nothing when we see form this would not be right it's about the experience of the form that is empty of the self and so to say form is emptiness and emptiness is form it means that both form and emptiness are not empty of each other that they are only each other you could now try to close your eyes 
Stay that way for a few seconds, and then open your eyes again. When you open your eyes, you see emptiness, and when you see form, you are looking at emptiness. In other words, when we say that all of the five skandhas, form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, are emptiness. And emptiness are these. The Hatha Sutra is teaching us that sensorium is all human experience. Anything else would just be mere talk. And so the Hatha Sutra goes on to say that Sariputra, emptiness, is the nature of all dharmas. It can neither be created nor annihilated, polluted or cleansed. Increased nor decreased. This is telling us that by emptiness we are referring to a special characteristic or quality. Being a principle itself, no physical phenomena can make any changes to it. And next, the Hatha Sutra says, therefore, in emptiness there is no form, feeling, perception, volition, or consciousness. And no eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. No form, sound, smell, taste, touch, or conception. No object of sight, and no consciousness. This displays the sensory process, where we see that the experiential aspects of the sensory process include seeing, hearing, smelling. Tasting, tactile sensation, and mental state. While the non-experiential is that which is beyond our physical ability to see, hear, smell, taste, tactile reception, and mental states. In other words, what we are really experiencing through the sensorium is carrying the nature of emptiness, and by realizing this. We come closer to empty ourselves of dukkha. A few years ago, I visited the Foguangshan Culture and Education Center in Beijing. It was a long rectangular building, and when I checked in, I came across a little girl who ran across the corridor, screaming, laughing, having fun with her family. After I dropped my luggage, I went on to have class, and by the time I returned to my room after 11 p.m., they had turned down the light in the corridor. So as I approached my room, I couldn't help but seeing that little girl standing alone at the end of the corridor. I wondered why, what at this time she would be out there alone. Was she waiting for somebody? Or was she scared to move around until her family came to fetch her? She was standing there quietly, and her skirt waving as the air condition continued to operate. I looked at her, and then even before I decided to approach her, this eerie feeling or sensation came across my mind. It was a question: Is that really a little girl? And if that's not a little girl, do I want to approach her? And at the end of the day, my decision my decision was to turn away and just walk into my room. But I spent the whole night wondering whether that was really the little girl I had come across early in the afternoon. The question just floated over my mind for the entire night, and somehow the eerie feeling carried on. Until the next morning, when I stepped out of my room, when there was sunlight, I once again looked down the corridor. I couldn't help but laugh at myself. It was just a tall green plant that was placed next to the window, and the skirt that was waving in the wind was actually a large leaf that moved along the air conditioning. And then at that moment. The eerie feeling of whether that was or was not a little girl just disappeared, and at that moment, I felt like I had emptied myself of the fear 
which I created out of nothing but my own preconceptions. Therefore, when Guanyin Bodhisattva or Avalokiteshvara says, we must first see that the five skandhas are empty, perhaps this is for us to realize that we should not grasp onto what our perceptions and volition and mental formation as well as consciousness are telling us to do. And so, so far, emptiness in the Heart Sutra shows us on level one, in order to overcome suffering or dukkha, we must first understand the emptiness of the self. Now we move on to the next passage in the Heart Sutra, where it says, No ignorance, nor its extinction. No aging and no death, nor their cessation. No suffering causes cessation, nor the path. In this section, we see that Sariputra is being taught the reality of practice, where we see that by using the sensorium, it tells us that what we experience is not the thing itself. But this is a moment of mere observation. We have to ask, who is looking at whom? This is where Sariputra is taught the importance of the Prana Paramita, where he now embarks on the journey of the Bodhisattva path by transformation of human consciousness so that the distinction between self and other is transcended and now absolute reality is experienced. So just as said before, on the first level, we see the emptiness of the self. And then this is the moment when we learn that in somehow a similar way, we are learning the emptiness of all phenomena in ourselves and outside ourselves. So as we look at um, the meaning of suffering, which are threefold just previously, we understand that suffering not only comes from the within, but what actually happens on the outside could continue to change our perspective of suffering and somehow cause us to mistake the fact that this dukkha is coming from the outside. Once there was a lady who was about to embark on a journey. It was a very full and busy day, and when she finally found herself a seat, it was shared with another young man. As she was waiting for the train to come, she decided to enjoy herself by reading a newspaper and treating herself to a pack of chocolate chip cookies. However, as she took out one chocolate chip cookie, something strange happened. The man sitting next to her, without saying a word, just reached out for that pack of chocolate chip cookie, which she had bought, and then helped himself with a piece. This made her very uneasy and unhappy. She was no longer able to focus on the newspaper she was reading. And all along, even though she was chewing her favorite chocolate chip cookie, all she could think about was, why is this man so rude by stealing my chocolate chip cookie? And to maintain her composure, she stayed calm and helped herself to a second piece of chocolate chip cookie. And then the funny thing happened. The men, too, without saying a word again, also helped him with a chocolate chip cookie. She held herself together and tried to be patient. And then finally, when there is only one piece of chocolate chip cookie left in the bag, she looked at the men and smiled, thinking, I am just going to wait to see if you would have at least the courtesy to let me have my own last piece of chocolate chip cookie since I have shared most of my packet with you. And then the man also turned to her, smiled, reached out for that final piece of chocolate chip cookie, broke it in half, and shared one half with her. As the lady's patience was about to uh, run out, as she was about to explode, luckily the train came. 
So she quickly gathered her bag, jumped onto the train, thinking that she would now finally be away from this rude, selfish man. And upon last glance, this man still showed her a smile. Perhaps he wanted to thank her for the free cookies. But now that she was finally sitting in the train, she told herself, "Look, I'm going on a holiday. I should not let this." Ruin my mood, so let me go back to the trip, enjoy my newspaper, and then get on with the holiday. But something fun, funny happened as she turned back to her bag to get her newspaper. What she saw in her bag was a whole new unopened chocolate chip cookie. So all along she has been eating out of the young man's bag of chocolate chip cookies. Who was very generous and kind to share with her, even till the last piece, with a smile. And so, as we say that sometimes dukkha it arises because of a disharmony between the self and the world. It is not to say that this world is enforcing disharmony onto us, but merely due to our preconceptions and our misunderstanding that what we are experiencing is the truth. That causes the dukkha. Therefore, coming to this part of the Heart Sutra, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva teaches Sariputra as well as all of us an understanding of emptiness, which applies not only in the coming together of the notion of self, but also in the coming together of all the phenomena that we live in, such as the cycle of birth and death. As well as dukkha and its causes, its cessation, nor the path. To understand that, after all, there is nothing to cling on to, and there is no need to treat them as the absolute reality. Then we have an opportunity not only to overcome suffering caused by the self, but also through understanding the emptiness of all phenomena. We would also be free from the bondages of the physical world that continues to cause us to dream and to have delusive thoughts. And now the last line in this section tells us that beyond the transcendence of the cycle of rebirth as well as dukkha and its end, eventually we come on to the bodhisattva path, where by understanding emptiness. For a bodhisattva, not only are there no longer a notion of the self or reality, there is even no notion of wisdom nor the attainment of that wisdom. In other words, we are now looking at level three emptiness, which is emptiness of even all concepts. Upon this level, the bodhisattva is teaching us how to transcend the dukkha. Caused by knowledge or concepts. So this is the moment when bodhisattvas overcome all senses of dualism. There are no longer the concepts of good or bad, you or me. Thereby, the bodhisattva sees the self and other as one. The bodhisattva sees dukkha and happiness as one. There are no longer differentiations. This is similar to the eyes of a mother, when her child is sick. You will see very often, when this case arises, it would come to the extent that even the mother herself gets sick just because her child is sick. So the bodhisattva heart is like a, a mother's heart, where she sees herself and her child as one. She feels everything that her child is feeling, especially the dukkha. And so, in other case, as we say that at this point there is no wisdom nor attainment, what the bodhisattva has realized is that whatever the bodhisattva attains, he should also help sentient beings attain the same thing. And whatever the sentient beings are feeling, the bodhisattvas would also feel. And this is, in particular, relevant to the cases of suffering. So you will see Avalokiteshvara. 
manifesting in all forms, and using all kinds of ways to cater to the needs of the myriad sentient beings in order to help them overcome suffering. And so the sutra goes: as there is nothing to attain, a bodhisattva who relies on the pranya paramita has neither worry nor obstruction. Since you have nothing to overcome, there is nothing that you would see as a challenge. And since you have nothing to attain, there is nothing you need to see or try to understand because everything is already a part of you. Without worry and obstruction, there is no fear. Away from confusion, confusion, daydreaming, and thus reaches nirvana. So we see that the bodhisattva attains the perfection of wisdom by overcoming all of these understandings, or the notions of the self, notion of the phenomena, or even notions of notions, and so. The bodhisattva is extremely clear and aware of what is happening in reality without being affected. That's why the bodhisattva has no confusion. And finally, reaching nirvana, the absolute moment of tranquility and freedom from all forms of discrimination. And this is where the Heart Sutra then moves on to say: Thus, one should know that pranya paramita is the great mantra, the mantra of illumination. And the supreme of all mantras. People would often ask whether the Heart Sutra is a sutra or a mantra, and the answer could be both. We would see from this line onwards, it covers the mantra aspect of the Heart Sutra, but anything before that follows the style of a prose、uh, is a more common. A、literary style that we see among Upanishad sutras that explains the journey of awakening, according to Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. But another way to look at the Heart Sutra is from this point onwards. You may not remember anything above, but finally, or even if you have really internalized all that has been taught apart above. Your understanding can be represented by this one final line, where it says, "Thus, in proclaiming the Pranya Paramita Mantra, one says, 'Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisvaha,' which means, 'Gone, Gone, Gone Beyond, Gone Together Beyond, Awakening All Hell.' And so, the attainment of the perfection of wisdom." Represents your ability to reach the far shore of enlightenment or nirvana from this shore of birth and death, where the river of experiences of reality, where we take one step at a time to overcome one delusion after the other through clear insight. So to sum up, the Heart Sutra in a nutshell. According to the teachings of Avalokiteshvara, helps us understand emptiness on three levels. First of all, emptiness of the self, where we will no longer hold on to the notion of self as something true or eternal, that it's constantly changing, it's not real, and it should not be something that controls us. And level two, we understand the emptiness of all phenomena. Even the reality of death, the reality of dukkha, can be something that once we attain the insight of prana paramita, can eventually overcome. But ultimately, what Avalokiteshvara wants to tell us is that emptiness of concepts, whereby saying that there is no wisdom nor attainment, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva reminds us that. The raft which we which carries us across the ocean or the river of birth and death, across to the far shore of nirvana, or enlightenment, eventually will have to be abandoned because they are, after all, only conventional. And the way bodhisattvas overcome the emptiness of the concepts is by blending both ends of dualism: to see self as other. To see good as bad, 
to see all of this together as part of the self, just like the mother. To a mother, all the good and bad experienced by her baby or her child would be part of her, and to in enable to really reach that state. We have to rely on our ability to slowly let go of our ego and attachment to what we think is reality. But certainly, there is still a lot for us to discuss today.、Uh, hopefully, I, j- I have been able to deliver a basic walkthrough of the Heart Sutra, so that from now onwards, whenever we chant the lines of this very short and concise text. We are able to dwell deeper into the very profound wisdom, which both the Buddha, Avalokiteshvara, and Sariputra can help us understand. So, thank you very much for listening. May this world be free from turmoil of the outbreak. May each and every one of us be safe and well. I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much.